Hello, this is Georgina Rose, part-time esoteric content creator and part-time looking for a new intro. And welcome back to the Dot Darling YouTube channel. On this channel, we discuss mysticism, religion, the occult, philosophy, and everything on the fringes of esoterica. And this video is a sort of versus video. I've done videos like this before, where basically I compare multiple occult and pagan traditions and talk about which one is right for you, for people who are sort of, sort of seeking out their path and figuring out what's right for them on their spiritual journey. And this is one that I figured I had done in the past because I've sort of touched on this topic before in videos and in podcasts, but I've never really fleshed it out. And so I really wanted to do that. And that would be the difference between neo-paganism and pagan reconstructionism. So first let's start with like some basic definitions. The term neo-pagan is really one that originates in academia. So obviously, the pagan religions of the ancient world did not continue in an unbroken lineage. I think we all know that. I think we are all historically literate enough to know that that's what happened. Basically, there were a bunch of religions all across Europe that existed and they were overwhelmingly polytheistic. They had natural reverence, they had ancestral reverence, but of course they were different in a lot of ways. Different traditions worked radically differently depending on where they were in Europe, but that all changed when Europe was converted to Christianity. I want to be clear, the European conversion was not something that happened instantly. Uh, different countries converted at radically different time periods, right? Like when Rome converted and when Lithuania, the last country to convert, converted, there was hundreds and hundreds of years of time between them. As well, when the conversion happened, generally it was cities that converted first and then rural areas converted later, which is actually where we get the term pagan. So the term pagan was not originally a really religious category. I mean, it kind of was, but the original connotation was basically like, hill person, kind of like how we would say redneck. And just like redneck, it kind of had that negative connotation. And so then the church went on to kind of define pagan as anyone who isn't Christian. Obviously now that's not how we define the word pagan. Like you wouldn't go and say that like Muslims are pagan because they're not Christian, right? Just logically, it doesn't make sense. So nowadays pagan as a term tends to refer to traditions that attempt to revive various spiritual traditions across from Europe. You can argue that certain non-European traditions would be pagan if you use specific definitions for pagan, but for simplicity's sake, we're going to be talking about European traditions. Um, the definitions of things is one of the biggest debates in religion, religious studies, and all that. So we could probably have like an hour-long discussion about what is a pagan, who is a pagan, who is not a pagan, but we're just going to keep it simple. Traditions that attempt to revive a polytheistic European spirituality. That's the definition we're running with. It's not the only definition of pagan out there, but that's the one we're going to use because that's the one that most people think of when they think of pagan. Now, the term neo-pagan denotes a revival. So when did this stuff start coming back? So there were a variety of movements um, and they were all around the same general period of time, though of course the exact times did vary depending on what you're looking at. But basically in the Victorian and Edwardian period, there were people kind of interested in bringing this stuff back, right? And different countries brought back different stuff. Um, in Germany, there was a big interest in sort of the Nordic Germanic paganism. And then in England, there was this interest in theosophy, thelema, or medicism, and uh, eventually Wicca. The Wicca would come a couple decades later. So... Nowadays, when we use the term neo-pagan, we aren't typically just referring to any sort of pagan revival, right? Colloquially, the term neo-pagan tends to refer to a tradition that is pagan, is polytheistic, but is not attempting to completely reconstruct what existed prior to the conversion. Whereas the term pagan reconstructionism or pagan recon is pretty much used for people who are attempting to directly reconstruct what existed before the conversion. Now, let's talk about some traditions that fall into either camp, and then I'm going to get into the arguments for each camp and where I fall on the subject. So when we look at neo-paganism, obviously the biggest thing people are going to think of is Wicca. Wicca is the largest pagan tradition, though it is starting to change a little bit. Wicca is a bit on the decline, but basically what Wicca is, I have a whole video on it, it was a tradition started by a guy named Gerald Gardner in England in the 40s to 60s, depending on which dates you're going to pull out of your hat. Um, and it's basically an attempt to revive a witch cult. This was based off the historicism of Margaret Murray, who has 
in more modern times pretty much been considered a bunk historian. Uh, but her history was believed at the time and she basically argued that after the conversion there was a surviving lineage of witch cults. Basically there were these secret covens all around Europe of mostly women, typically midwives, who would get together and do these rituals. And using some of the similar imagery from the Malleus Maleficarium and Infinis witch hunting manual, she had this very out into nature, dancing with the horned god type image of what surviving paganism was, which this idea does actually come from the Malleus Maleficarium, which is a very controversial document by this one guy within the church who wanted to hunt witches. And this became the basis of a lot of the witch hunts across Europe. Now, at the time, a lot of the church actually disagreed with this guy. He was seen as a pariah. He was seen as a basically a crazy dude, but a lot of people did take him seriously. And so this sort of imagery entered Margaret Murray's history, though it's not entirely by that. And I don't want to give that all the credit for what Margaret Murray said, because I think it is possible that there were people here and there who were having pagan cults around Europe, but the idea that it was a continuous, unbroken lineage is just not true, tragically. I feel like it works really well as a sort of mythic history. I like that term, right? Like it's a modern folklore. And I think it works well in that way because there have been people who out of Wicca and sort of later traditions that broke off of Wicca who have attempted to recreate that and have had spiritual results that work. So I want to say that even if it's not like the perfect history, right, even if there's not this secret witch lineage that's existed since antiquity, I think there's still some value in reading that and looking into that and seeing what Margaret Murray had to say, even if she is considered a bit of a crank nowadays. But there are other traditions that would fall under neo-paganism, and that would just be really anything that's not trying to reconstruct. Um, neo-paganism is not lesser than reconstructionism. Reconstructionists tend to get really elitist about this and be a bit of an asshole. But there are many, many groups that have attempted to, you know, create a new paganism. And I think the big theological argument for this that I find the most compelling is the idea that if paganism had never been converted, had never died out, so to speak, modern paganism would not be what paganism was back then. And I think the easiest way to see how that would happen is to look at the Hinduism of India. Obviously, Hinduism and European paganism are rather different, but they are similar in specific ways. And you can notice that the Hinduism that exists a thousand years ago is not the Hinduism that exists now. And so logically, it follows that why would our modern paganism look like the ancient paganism? As well, a lot of neo-pagans believe that what matters most is connected to the gods, and that sometimes if you get too caught up in recreating history, you become sort of a historical reenactor rather than a person trying to seek out an authentic personal spirituality. Now, let's look at Reconstructionism. Obviously, the biggest Reconstructionist tradition that people are going to think of is Alsatru. Alsatru is a subtype of Nordic paganism where people worship and venerate the Aesir. Uh, Alsatru is pretty much always very Reconstructionism heavy. People who are really into this stuff and really broadly into Nordic paganism tend to read a lot of history and the thing is about that is they are trying to reconstruct as best as possible. Sadly, the thing is with pagan Reconstructionism and the thing that makes it really difficult is that no real pagan culture left behind the most useful records. Obviously, we have better records of some than others. Uh, Hellenistic forms of paganism, we have the best records on, uh, with this one document called the Greek Magical Papyri being a grimoire and ritual manual that has survived since antiquity, making people who are Hellenistic in any form reconstructionists have the sort of easiest job with this. But, you know, even if you are reconstructing, you're always going to have to fill in blanks. There's always going to be things that you have to um, fill in. Um, another tradition that's sort of a reconstructionist tradition would be uh, people who are trying to bring back uh, Celtic forms of paganism. Celtic is an interesting term because it's essentially an umbrella term. There is not one Celtic paganism. There are a variety of Celtic pagan traditions, whether that be Irish paganism, Welsh paganism, etc., 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 and those people uh, do typically distinguish. There is this problem where a lot of books written about trying to reconstruct Celtic traditions, just call it Celtic paganism, and sort of do this thing where they smash all the Celtic paganisms together and try to make it one tradition. So at that point, it's almost not reconstructionism because you're trying to reconstruct a hybrid child of reconstructionist traditions. Um, as well, people who are into Anglo-Saxon paganism or Anglo-Saxon heathenry, that's pretty much a reconstructionism thing. Once again, they've got the problem with the records, but, you know, that's where figuring things out has to come in, right? 
Because the truth is, even in the Reconstructionist traditions, there's always things that people are bringing together. And that's just, that's just the reality of it. There's nothing wrong with that. Some people use that as some sort of gotcha at paganism, like, oh, your traditions suck so much, you have to reconstruct them, you have to sew them together, you have to do guesswork after a certain point. And I feel like that's a very horrible argument because people are still trying and people are still having an authentic connection with the gods, even if, of course, they have to, you know, connect some things here and there or try to bridge things. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, even in modern Christianity, there are people creating new liturgy and new forms of worship. So, of course, we're going to have to create our new forms of worship. We're going to have to create our own liturgy using what we have from the past and bringing it all together to make that new tradition that really works for us. So, in a sense, even Reconstructionists are still having to add new things, and that's okay. Thankfully, with time, more and more of this stuff is getting translated, which is a huge, huge benefit to those who reconstruct because, you know, academia has taken a bit more of an interest into the occult and paganism because our numbers are soaring currently. And so there's been a renewed interest in scholarship, which means people who are actually trained to read these languages as tragically many of the languages that the text from the pagan world were written in are not currently used languages. The academics are able to actually read it and make it something that we can actually use and work with. Now, what is my position on the recon neo-pagan debate? I honestly lean towards neo-paganism because I feel as if my goal as a spiritual person is finding truth. There's a really great Blavatsky quote, Blavatsky's polarizing, I won't get into that now, that says the highest form of religion is truth. And so for me, I'm interested in finding the spiritual truth. I'm interested in gnosis. And so I feel like it is cool and okay to blend things together. For me, I do take some Reconstructionist traditions into what I do. I still learn from that. I think even if you are a neo-pagan, you should not disregard history. You should not disregard the past. Of course, you don't need to be as into history as someone who's a hardline Reconstructionist is, but you still need to know what you're pulling from and what you're learning from. You can't just disregard history. I don't care if you're a Wiccan and you're like, well, that's not relevant to me. That's not what I do. There still is stuff from that that's necessary because even if you're, say, a Wiccan, you're still trying to bring something back, right? There's this underlying tone to paganism that we're trying to bring back the old world. It's just really, how do we bring it back? Because even Wicca's trying to bring it back. No matter what tradition you're in, you're trying to reconstruct something. It's just how close are you getting? That's really what it comes down to. How much does the historical accuracy matter to you versus how much does whatever your ritualistic goals matter to you? That's what you have to weigh out. I find that people who are really ritual and magic oriented tend to be less reconstructionist because I find that people who are really ritual heavy tend to be a bit more eclectic and a bit more syncretic. For those who don't know, eclecticism is kind of the thing of the past couple couple decades. There's a huge rise of people, mostly thanks to the internet, who are able to merge traditions together. Before the rise of the internet, to get involved with the pagan community and to learn about paganism in the way that people are doing it now and not just through like history books, you had to join an in-person group. You had to go outside, leave your house, touch grass, and find a local organization. And those organizations, like even now, if you try to join a real life pagan group, they're almost always based around a specific tradition, whether that be Alcestry, whether it be Wicca, whether it be Philema, they all typically have a tradition at their core. Whereas with the internet, that's not as true, right? On the internet, you can learn about a variety of pagan traditions. You can go into a bookstore now, and a Barnes and Noble even, a mainstream bookstore, because previously you kind of had to look around to get your occult books. You can just walk into one and grab a book on Balkan paganism, Slavic paganism, all this stuff, whereas previously you had to join a physical group. And so because of that, people are really kind of stepping outside of the tradition that they're part of and learning about more general stuff. And so you've seen this huge rise in people who are more eclectic, and the thing is, when you get more eclectic, you're inherently not reconstructing. Because back in the day, the pagan traditions were basically separate religions. They were very, very different. And a pagan in Rome and a pagan in Norway would not have seen themselves as part of the same tradition. Whereas now we have this com community, if you want to call it that, I think subculture might be a better word, where we're all in one space and we're all talking, we're all interacting, even reconstructionist I find like you see the Nordic pagans and the Cel Celtic pagans interacting constantly. And so there's a much bigger exchange flow of ideas leading to people being more eclectic 
and bringing things together in syncretism. As well, I've seen a rise in more and more people kind of being perennialist, that they won't always call themselves perennialists. That's what they're doing. They're saying that all of these traditions are sort of different pathways up the same mountain to find truth. Furthermore, the ancient pagan world did have a bit of exchange and interaction. I don't want to say that it didn't. If you look historically at um, the way certain gods have been popularized and moved around, you notice that during different periods of time, different gods were popular and different gods appeared in different places. And you'll notice that it's a lot less static than I think modern pagans think it do. I think we have this idea that like, there was a paganism, it never changed and evolved, but like all religions, paganism was always changing, it was always evolving. And if you look at the history of Europe, which I think you kind of have to understand to fully reconstruct pagans, you have to know what Europe was like, you have to know what Europe was doing, you'll notice that, you know, people were conquesting each other, people were going after each other, people were raiding other people. And so obviously with that, their religions interacted, their peoples interacted, and things sort of moved around and changed and evolved. And you see certain gods sort of seeming like they appear under a different name and other culture. You see it all the time. And so it's it's interesting to actually look at the history of Europe and see how things moved and changed. Uh, now, the people who are really into Reconstructionism, I, I realized I went on a bit of a tangent, tend to be devotional polytheists. I find that people who are really focused on that side of their practice do tend to be more construction, Reconstructionist based. Devotional polytheism, for the unfamiliar, are people who are not ritualists, they're not magical pract practitioners, they're just people who are devoted to the gods and essentially just use it as a religion, which is completely valid. Uh, I think that's a absolutely legitimate approach. And those people I've noticed do tend to be more reconstructionist. I think they are more reconstructionist because reconstructionism sort of gives you more of a map and you can look at what the ancient sort of members of these faiths did as your sort of guideline. As well, it also kind of, I don't know how to put this, but in the ancient world, not every pagan was also a magical practitioner. Nowadays, pagan and occultist, there's a huge, huge overlap and connection between the two. If you go into a bookstore and you buy pagan books, almost always it's gonna to touch on magic, ritual, the occult. Whereas historically, that was not part of all pagans' lives. Much like if you look at Christianity now, right? Not all Christians are mystics. I would go so far as to say the small minority of modern Christians are mystics. That was true in the ancient pagan world. There were mystics. There were some really beautiful esoteric traditions that thankfully people are reviving. But once again, like not all ancient pagans were occultists. And all pa certainly not all ancient pagans are wishes. Many would probably not like that term. So devotional polytheism does tend to be reconstructionist. But I have seen some eclectics who are devotional polytheists. I have seen some neo-pagans who are devotional polytheists. So really the reconstructionism versus neo-paganism question and debate is just a personal look at what matters to you spiritually. There's no right or wrong answer here. It's just what makes more sense to you. I also want to say, and this is sort of the thing that I've kind of been touching on this whole video, but haven't said point blank. I don't know if it's as hard of a line as people make it out to be. I don't know if it's exactly you pick one or you pick the other. You're either also true or you're Wiccan and that's reconstructionism and this is neo-paganism because whether you're a neo or a recon, you're still bridging things, you're still connecting things, you're still making things up. And even if you're a neo-pagan, you're still pulling from the past. So I'm not sure if it's really as hard of a break and as a dichotomy as it's sometimes portrayed. But then again, that's kind of something I say a lot. I think that a lot of dichotomies don't fully exist because people live in the gray and people live in the nuance. So that's most of what I want to say. But before I go and before I give my final thoughts, I have a word from our sponsors. So thank you to Gothic for making this video possible. Gothic is a jewelry and accessory line. They sell all sorts of goth, pagan, and spiritual themed jewelry. It's at a reasonable price point, And I really like what they do. This Molnir, if you look up at it, is from there. So are these matching Molnir earrings. I realized you couldn't see them in the entire video, but I tried. Um, this, for instance, works for women and for men. They have jewelry designed for both women and for men. They also have rings, they have earrings, they have bracelets, they have all sorts of jewelry options for you. So check them out. Um, I'll link to them below. You should use my link because it helps me out. But yeah, highly recommend them. I think that they do some really cool stuff. So check them out. And thank you so much to Gothic for helping make this video possible. Now, if you want to find me, I'm Georgina Rose or Dot Darling, D-A-A-T. I am on most social media platforms. I'm here on YouTube, obviously, but I'm also on Twitter, TikTok. I'm on Substack. I'm on Telegram. 
Uh, I'm on Twitch. I stream every Tuesday night at 9 p.m. I host the podcast, The Postmodern Iconoclast, which is a commentary podcast here and on, it's also on my YouTube channel, uh, but it's also on all sorts of podcasting platforms. And if you want to support me to enable me to make more videos, you can check out my Patreon. On my Patreon, I give all these videos early. I give um, extra videos once a month. I write ritual guides, which have been over 20 pages recently, basically 20 pages of rituals, prayers, and stuff that I've written. So you can actually, you know, apply the stuff that I say in my videos and actually do it. You can also donate directly through Ko-Fi if you want to do a one-time single donation. They take no fees, which I really appreciate. They only, I mean, they, they take the fees of like the payment processors, but the website itself didn't take fees, which is really helpful for me. Um, and yeah. I think that's everywhere you can find me. Like, comment, subscribe, uh, and ring the bell. And if you're subscribed for 93 days, you'll meet your holy guardian angel, and you will never need to know what a neo-pagan or a pagan reconstructionist is again. All right, bye.